everyone, and welcome to another Wednesday night Isaiah study. And so we are starting chapter 40. And chapter 40, there is so much great things, so many great things in chapter 40. And uh, so uh, before I begin, uh, note the UMJA, you can check out the website, and also um, the uh, telegram channel you can catch me on telegram if you want to talk to me about anything you know concerning scripture or whatever and so uh tonight we are looking at isaiah 40 verses 1 through 6 and i titled the study anti-missionary questions about believing in yeshua as the messiah of god okay so um i got 30 slides here there is a lot of material it'll take me a little bit to go through and there is a lot of great content here in Isaiah uh, chapter 40, the first six verses, and I hope uh, you will be as excited as I am because th these are just these are some great verses here. So um, before we begin, let's let's open with a word of prayer. Abba Shabbat Shalom, Anu Modim Lecha Al Kol Haberachot Shalach Shalach Azur Lanu Lekachat Et Ketavei Hakadosh. Ul yasam et ha ha amitut halul bechayenu b'shem Yeshua anach nimit palalim amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your blessings. Help us to take the holy scriptures, apply these truths to our lives. In Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, I organize these videos into three parts part one part two part three in the live stream you get all three parts one after the other so uh if you can stand it listen to the whole thing you know it it takes uh about an hour and a half so uh let's begin okay so here in in isaiah chapter 40 we note when we think back on Isaiah, we, we note the reoccurring theme, okay? So we're looking at Isaiah chapter 7 through 39, okay? And the over overarching theme here in the earlier part of Isaiah here was that God can be trusted regardless of what happens in our lives. And we see in the history of Israel and Judah and Jerusalem, the people were continually tempted to trust in someone else, you know, someone uh, Mishahu, or something, Mashahu, right? Or other than God, the God of Israel. And so the Lord God called men, such as Isaiah, as a prophet of God to go to the people, to bring them the word of God, to encourage them to turn from their sins and to seek the God of Israel in his holy and righteous ways. And so we read in the Isaiah text again and again how the Lord God is trustworthy, how he is faithful to his people, as Isaiah states that the Lord will deliver them even though they are worthy of destruction. And we read about this in Isaiah chapter 9 and Isaiah chapter 30. Now, okay, check it out. And so when considering the remainder of the book of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, and we're starting chapter 40 here, uh, modern scholars... They state that the book of Isaiah is divided into three major sections, and this is one of the division points. Okay, so um, I list out how the modern scholarship looks at the book of Isaiah. So uh, they they say the chapters chapters one through thirty nine. 1 through thirty nine is traditionally attributed to Isaiah of Jerusalem, who lived in the eighth century BC. It contains prophecies about the judgment of Judah and Israel for their sins, as well as prophecies about the future restoration of the people. Okay, and then they say chapters 40 through 55, this section is known as the second Isaiah or the Deutero-Isaiah. Okay, so they say it is thought to have been written by a different, different author in the 6th century. Okay, and you know, it's important to note here because you're, we're talking the 8th century when, all, when Isaiah was alive, and here they're talking about the 6th century when the Babylonian invasion occurred, okay? So um, they say that this is during the Babylonian exile, 
and it contains prophecies of comfort and hope for the exiles, as well as prophecies about the coming of a messianic figure. Okay, and then the last, the third section they say is is uh, chapters fifty six to sixty six, and they say this is known as the third Isaiah or the Trito Isaiah. You know, and it is thought to have been written by a different author. You know, so you got they're saying there's three authors, and they're saying this is a fifth century BC author that is after the exile and it contains prophecies about the restoration restoration of Jerusalem and the establishment of a new Davidic king. Okay, so the traditional view is that these three sections are all independent of one another. Okay. And however, in when I was reading through the commentaries, looking to see what, what they say concerning these things, that uh, recent years, scholars, many scholars have argued that the book of Isaiah is actually a unified composition. You know, they, they write to the evidence saying, the following evidence, they say, one, that there are many similarities in language, style, and theme between the different sections. Two, the latter sections seem to be dependent on the earlier sections. You know, for example, Isaiah quotes from the first Isaiah, you know, the first section here, Isaiah chapter 1 through 39, um, he quotes from this first section in several occasions. And then um, third is that the book of Isaiah as a whole presents a coherent message of judgment and restoration. Okay, so while there is still no consensus in modern scholars on this issue, the idea of a unified uh, book of Isaiah is gaining traction, you know, it's increasing in acceptance. And so there are some interesting facts about the book of Isaiah. For example, the book of Isaiah begins and ends with the word comfort. You know, so you got Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 to Isaiah chapter 66 verse 13. Okay, begins and ends with the word comfort and suggesting that it's a unified composition. The book of Isaiah contains a number of reoccurring themes. You have the servant of the Lord, the new creation, the messianic age, right? The uh, trusting in God, right? And these themes are developed throughout the book, suggesting that it, again, is a unified work. And the book of Isaiah also contains these cross, cross references where one section refers to another section that suggests that the author of the book was familiar with the entire book and was deliberately weaving together the narrative. And so overall... The evidence on Isaiah suggests <laughs> by some commentators is that the book of Isaiah is a unified composition. You know, however, these commentators always leave the potential for doubt. And they'll say in quotes, Isaiah is a unified composition if it were not written by a single author. You know, if it was not written by... Okay, so when we read through the book of Isaiah... You know, we, we, we find a coherent message of judgment and restoration, and the different sections are interconnected in a number of ways. You know, and it's not to mention even that uh, the only manuscript evidence that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Leningrad Codex is a unified whole. You know, we see no evidence for redaction. We see no evidence for uh, various uh, manuscripts having different Isaiah text. It's it's identical, I and mean, this is a testimony to the uh, the the scribes, the Jewish scribes in their day, in preserving the word of God and being very meticulous in the way that they copied the text. Okay, and now so the 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 scholars they reason they they reason these these three sections because um they they don't uh take it as that from the sense that they don't believe that there is such a thing as predictive prophecy, that that God is in the business of knowing the future. Yeah, I know people who believe that, you know, and, and I've, uh, I've argued, for example, uh, you, the idea of time travel with Einstein's theory of relativity, and we've, we've proven this, you know, the faster you travel, as you reach the speed of light, time slows down. So essentially, uh, and the time remains constant at the reference point, but it slows down, right? So um, the the idea is that God, being of infinite power and infinite speed, right, could can see the future, 
right? He knows what's what's going to happen. So he has this, he, there, there's an actual practical application for time travel, for knowing the future here. And, um, you know, and we know that God is capable. And so the Lord is in the business of predictive prophecy. But what my point is, is that these scholars and these modern commentaries, they, they always, they throw at, they throw at us this potential for doubt. You know, they, they throw at us this, this idea that something God can't do, right? And uh, the, again, you know, what, what this shows, reveals to me is that this is a lack of faith. You know, how faith and the lack of faith can have such an impact on the interpretation and understanding of the biblical text. You know, so this, this is so important and uh, to realize, you know, that, uh, that faith is required in order to understand the text, okay, we can we can read the text. I mean, you got these you got these commentators that they might not even believe in Yeshua. They might not even believe in God, our Father in heaven. They may just be university professors looking for more funding, so they just keep the wheel rolling. You know, we don't know, but um, because there are those out there like that. But um, my point is, is that in order to read the text and to truly understand the text. We have to have faith. Faith is absolute. It is an absolute necessity because the lack of faith will affect and impact the understanding of an interpretation of the biblical text. And why I say this is so important because it just brings up the anti-missionary claims, okay? Then, and, and because right, right there we have this instant, we have this lack of faith, okay? And one, and it's in regard to Yeshua being the Messiah of God. And so I had put into the study a couple of questions that I've seen recently on Facebook regarding faith in Yeshua by an intermissionary, an Orthodox uh, friend of mine that I know. And um, he says the following. He asks these questions. He goes, he says, uh, here, he says, do you really believe that a person has to believe in Yeshua before understanding how the scriptures speak about him. Okay, that was one question. And then he reiterated that, that question saying, are you saying that I cannot understand the, understand the scriptures properly until I first place my faith in Yeshua? Okay, so he was trying to clarify the previous statement, okay, and in so um, the 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 answer to that question, you know, based on what we're you know just looking at the Isaiah text, looking at what all the commentaries are saying, but um, also knowing what the scriptures say here in, in the New Testament text. But based on this the this question, the answer to this question is a resounding yes. You know, before we can understand the messianic prophecies and believe who Yeshua is according to the Tanakh. We have to take that leap of faith to accept what the New Testament says about him, about Yeshua. And then from this perspective, from this reference point on faith, then we explore the Tanakh and we explore the rabbinic writings and, and, and so forth to see if these things are true. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about, we're going to discuss here in a little bit, on uh, regarding the anti-missionaries in the rabbinic literature is from the sense that uh, if we look at the ancient text, you know, I, I'm always say, go back to the original languages, go to the Hebrew, go to the Greek, look what it says, struggle with it, figure out what it says, okay, and then uh, go to the rabbinic literature, but go to the ancient text, okay, go go to the and, and look at that and see what it says, you know, and because. Modern Judaism says something different than what we see in the ancient text. And we, we will see this here in a little bit. But uh, what I want to uh, talk about here right now is this issue or this idea of do we need faith first in order to even understand the scriptures? And the New Testament example of this I want to give is from Luke chapter 24. And so we have right here, in Luke 24, and it says the following. Okay, so it says, and as they spoke, and as, as as they thus spake, Yeshua, Jesus, stood himself, stood in the midst of them, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified 
and affrighted, and suppose that they had seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, and see, for a spirit have no flesh and bone, as you see me have. Okay, And then, when he had spoken thus, or thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were believing, and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said to them, have you here any meat? Okay, so the one, one point is that, you know, obviously the disciples had faith in Yeshua, right? They obviously had faith. Obviously they were seeing him physically here. They were touching him physically, but yet they still didn't believe. There was something more that was needed, okay? So, um, and it goes on, and so he asked for meat, for something to eat, and so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and he ate before them, okay? And then he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the Torah of Moshe, right? The law of Moses and in the prophets and in um in the in the Psalms concerning me. And then here in verse 45 is the most significant part point here. Okay, verse verse 45 it says, "Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and he said to them, "Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, to raise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until um, you be endued with power from on high. And then we remember during Shavuot, later on in Acts that that is what happened. and But my point here is exactly what we've been talking about here, that it says here that Yeshua had to open their understanding. He literally had to open their understanding. So the disciples, they, they still had doubt, even being in the presence of Yeshua, touching him with their hands, and uh, him speaking to them, him eating, and so what happened here was that Yeshua then opened their understanding so that they could understand the scriptures. And the significance of this is that these men spent their entire lives in the synagogue learning the scriptures. They spent three years with Yeshua learning from him about the, the word of God, right? And about him, about Yeshua. And yet, they didn't understand the scriptures. They didn't understand about the Messiah and what he was to do. You know, one needed to have his or her understanding literally unlocked by the Messiah himself. And this is the concept of believing, of having faith in what the New Testament text states is true. And then walking in that faith to investigate the things that are written based in the Tanakh and or in in the rabbinic literature, right? And we we don't we don't spin that around. We spin that around, and we'll we'll get deceived, right? And the point is, is that we have to have faith, you know. In in a similar manner, we will take by faith that the book of Isaiah is a compositional whole, that the entire book of Isaiah was written by the hand of Isaiah and is not an agglomeration of different redactors taking and putting the text together and uh, the trio or trito Isaiah, as some would claim. You know, the manuscript evidence in and of itself is a testimony to the continuity of the scriptures. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. As we see the continuity continuing from what we, we saw previously, or what we see here in tonight's study on Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 6. Okay, so 
Um, the book of Isaiah is not in a, we'll take by faith, the book of Isaiah is not an agglomeration of compositions that someone put together, crammed together to make this narrative because we, because someone believes that they don't believe that God can, can give a prophecy of the future, right? Okay, so um, we believe that the God of Israel is in the business of prophecy and of reveal, revealing future events to his people, okay? So when we believe the Word of God is a compositional whole, then we can see how God is trustworthy and how this trustworthiness does not be, um, does not end at the point of disobedience, okay? And um, another point is like in dispensationalism. You know, and I, I come from the background where there was hyper-dispensationalism. Everything is ended. The gifts, the healings, everything ended. Now we got the Word of God. All we got is love, okay? That, that, there were churches 30 plus years ago that I, I attended that that said those things. This, this is the background I come from. But um, the point is, is that when men take these theologies and then they they sow doubt, they sow doubt, you know. And so if if someone believes in this this form of dispensationalism, that God's not in the business of healing, why would you pray why would you expect God to heal someone in this day and age, right? You're not, you're not going to get a healing. You're not going to see the power of God working in our life because of a lack of faith in, because of this theology. And so the, you know, I'm, I'm really, I hammer on these theologies. I prefer to just look at the Word of God and believe, okay, and just, just believe. Okay, so um, I got off track. Okay, so God is the God of, he's in the business of prophecy. He's in the business of revealing future events, revealing himself to, to, uh, to us, you know. And when we believe that the, God, that the Bible is a, the word of God is a compositional whole, you know, then we can see how God is trustworthy and how his trustworthiness, like I said, doesn't depend upon disobedience or it doesn't end doesn't end on disobedience I mean, because he is the god of uh, that seeks for our repentance you know he can he continues to be the lord the god of history to deliver those who would disobey but would then turn back to him in faith you know the lord is always calling us to turn back to him in faith to turn from our sins to to walk in his holy and righteous ways okay so what this reveals to us is this concept of grace, okay? How Israel was given the grace to believe and be saved, just as the New Testament text describes the mercy and grace of God. You know, so again, we see a continuity all, all throughout Scripture. This is illustrated in the Lord God knowing his people will forsake him at one point, yet promising in advance to redeem them without silver and gold, just like we see in Isaiah 55, verse 1. You know, these things reveal to us how the Lord God can be trusted without a doubt. You know, we have there's no reason to doubt the power of God, right? And we also note how the Lord God of Israel is a God of repentance and return, which is illustrated in how he will cause his people to return from exile, as we'll read in chapter 41 of Isaiah. Okay, so he will do this by destroying the pride of of Babylon through Cyrus, who was a previously unknown ruler, who will not come from any of the established kingdoms of the Mesopotamian Valley. Okay, so when we survey the remainder of Isaiah chapters uh, 40 through 66, okay, um, God's desire and ability to save, you know, we, we find that it, these, these Isaiah's words will touch on the servant the, the, the suffering servant, right, and the salvation of the nations. We note how the, the, the breadth of Isaiah's topics touches upon all of these things. And, and it's no wonder the book of Isaiah is the second most quoted book in all of the New Testament text. You know, we read, we look at the, the, the first most quoted book is the, the book of Psalms, you know, Sefer Tehillim. And then the second most frequent book is Sefer Yeshaya, you know, the book of Isaiah. So again, we note that the remainder of Isaiah's chapters, you know, 40 through 66, we're starting here in the first six verses, speak to what is coming due to unrepentant sin 
provides us with a hope of restoration and of atonement and the forgiveness of sins. So, so the, the reason being is that we serve a merciful God, a merciful and gracious God who forgives and restores and waits patiently for us to repent, to turn from our sins. What more could we ask from the one who created us, the one who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins? Okay, so um, what a wonderful God we serve. Okay, so that was the introduction to the Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 6. So next, we will look at uh, part 2. So we'll look directly at the text here. Thank <laughs> you.